Good evening and thank you for joining us for Kremlin News 10 at 10, where we give you more news in less time. Let's get started. New tonight, after a tense three hour hearing, the judge presiding over the Moscow murder trial is pushing back Brian Koberger's change of venue hearing well into the summer. Today, Latah County Judge John Judge announced that he is not ready to make a decision on whether the defense team tainted potential jurors with a survey. The prosecution argued that the survey violates the court's non dissemination order. The defense also presented a PowerPoint that deals with change of venue that the state said it isn't prepared to address. Judge Judge spoke to both sides after today's argument. It's something that I'm going to have to struggle through and figure out. Uh, you know, I'm not it is unclear when the judge's decision on the jury survey will be released. However, in an effort to give both sides more time, the judge has set Koberger's change of venue hearing to June 27th. Now to the shocking arrest of an 18 year old in Coeur d'Alene for allegedly planning terrorist attacks in the name of ISIS. Alexander Mercurio pleaded not guilty to providing material support to ISIS in a federal courtroom today. An indictment filed yesterday states that Mercurio is charged with attempting to provide material support to a designated foreign terrorist organization. He denied the criminal forfeiture allegation as well, meaning that he does not want the court to seize his property. Coeur d'Alene Mayor Jim Hammond says this activity came as a surprise to him and the local community. I think that anybody living in North Idaho uh, would be crazy to think that they could get any sympathy from anybody else regarding ISIS or any support for any kind of similar organization. Court documents show that Mercurio could face a maximum penalty of up to 20 years in prison. Today, he waived his detention hearing, meaning that he will remain in U.S. Marshal custody. He is now set to go to trial at the end of May. And as we work to bring you more to every story, Kreb 2's Whitney Ward spoke with an expert in homegrown extremism. Matt Kreiner works at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. He is a regular consultant for the U.S. State Department. He told us cases like this one in Coeur d'Alene are unfortunately more common than you might think. The individual really represents a, a growing issue that we're facing in the United States. There's this um, increasing issue of radicalization after the COVID era when individuals were forced into their homes a lot more frequently than they would have been in the past. So they're consuming the internet and the, the weird parts of the internet, the things that get a little bit uh, scary or a little bit risky. Do you think that most people would be alarmed at how Matt told us that the FBI often waits for some threshold to be crossed before moving in to make an arrest. Another high profile case that we are tracking tonight, the first witnesses took the stand in the trial of Chad Daybell, the Idaho man accused in the death of his late wife and two of his current wife's kids. JJ and Tylee were found dead on Daybell's property in 2020. Their mom, Lori Ballow, was found guilty on those same charges in the spring. Today started with opening statements. Both sides essentially provided a roadmap to jurors about what they can expect to hear. You'll hear about a pivotal date that set in motion the deaths of Tammy, Tylee, and JJ. October 26, 2018. Don't be distracted by speculation. Don't be distracted by guesses or assumptions or hunches. It all comes down to facts and evidence. The trial is expected to last eight to 10 weeks. Daybell is facing the death penalty. New tonight, Spokane police are searching for a suspect in a credit union robbery earlier today. So take a look at your screen here. Police are searching for this man who they say robbed a credit union on East 3rd Avenue this afternoon. SPD says the man demanded money from the teller and walked out with some cash. Police believe the man is between 30 and 40 years old, as well as being about five feet, six inches tall with a thin build. If you have any information, you are asked to call that number right there at the bottom of your screen. Tonight, a lot of questions after a University of Washington football player was arrested and charged with raping two women. 18 year old Tylan Rogers is now out on bail. Connor Borg with our Seattle sister station has reaction from students tonight. Right here near Husky Stadium is where 18 year old football player Tylan Rogers was arrested on Friday. Today, students say they are surprised and concerned about these allegations. UW is still riding high from making it to the national championship last season, but now some students are concerned that one of the players in that big game is accused of raping two women. I was kind of surprised. It was like my first time hearing about it 
considering how popular our, our football team was this year. Court documents show both of the alleged rapes happened in October and November, and that both women connected with Rogers over the dating app Tinder. The first survivor reported the rape to police on October 28th, and the second survivor reported it to police on February 23rd. Court documents show the first survivor also filed a report with the University of Washington on November 28th. At the end of November, Rogers was suspended from the football team. He did not travel with UW to the Pac-12 championship game on December 1st. However, two weeks later, he was allowed to return to the team. He went on to play in the Sugar Bowl and the national championship game in January. Former head coach Kalen DeBoer did not explain why Rodgers was suspended at the end of November. Towards the end of that suspension, offensive coordinator Ryan Grubb told the media he was working through some challenges he's had off the field. Students at UW say if the university knew anything about the rape accusations, he should not have been allowed to play. Definitely really shocking. I think that he shouldn't have played that game. I think that it should have been um, the school, the school should have known about it earlier is what I think. I understand he was probably an important part of the team and everything, but that like levity of, 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 of accusation is, is pretty serious. The dating app Tinder released a statement saying, what has been reported is horrible and has no place on our platform or anywhere. We have banned this account and will fully cooperate with law enforcement on their investigation. I asked for an interview with Seattle police, but they said no because they are still investigating. Now, Rogers is expected to be arraigned next week. His bail was set at $300,000 total, and he has bailed out. At Husky Stadium, Connor Board, King 5 News. All righty, let's switch gears and take a quick look at the forecast with Chief Meteorologist Jeremy the Good. Jeremy, are our temperatures still looking like they're going to climb in the coming days? Yeah, believe it or not, I think we uh, start our warming trend even right now. All right. Seriously, hear me out on this one. 51 degrees, and that's all thanks to the cloud cover that took over. And look, as we head through the night, we typically see our coldest hours right around daylight, right? 7 a.m. We're going to be in the upper 30s, and this is the coldest we get in the next few days. That's all thanks to the cloud cover moving through. And as we get into the day tomorrow, Expect more of it. Reason being, this line of clouds you see out here is eventually going to make its way in toward us. That brings us that next round of cloud cover, but also the warmer temperatures. It's a southwesterly advection. Basically, we're getting the warmer weather from down to our south and out to our west. So tomorrow afternoon, we top out at 62, 64 by Friday afternoon, and by Saturday and Sunday, highs near 70 with nothing but sun. Looking forward to that. Jeremy, thank you very much. Now to our night beat with a quick look at today's top stories. Spoken leaders are urging federal lawmakers to pass stronger internet protections for children. They are pressing for the passage of the bipartisan Kids Online Safety Act. That act aims to help regulate social media platforms by allowing parents to control the content their children see. The bill was introduced yesterday, but there isn't a timeline on when it could get passed through the House. Kids these nowadays don't even use a text message or text, right? They'll DM, they'll snap. If a kid wants to meet a kid, they'll say, can I have your snap, right? So it's here to stay. Um, so we need not get rid of it, but we need to figure out how to, to play and work safely within it. Well, that's a parent who lost his son because of what he says was the influence of social media. Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers told Krem2 that the data privacy bill she is trying to get passed is foundational to passing this bill. The data privacy bill is focused on protecting people's personal data. A brand new environmental protection agency ruling could save lives and prevent damaging illnesses linked to chemical exposure. Today, the EPA announcing first ever national regulations for forever chemicals in drinking water. The new EPA decision requires public drinking water systems to monitor, reduce and report high levels of six of the most common and toxic chemicals known as PFAS. The chemicals can last for thousands of years in the environment and exposure has been linked to cancer, liver and heart issues and developmental issues for children too. These chemicals entering our environment in an uncontrolled manner are harmful to our families, harmful to our communities and harmful to our economy. EPA will be spending $1 billion to help states and territories meet the new standards. CREM2 has been tracking the PFAS contamination in airway heights for the last seven years now. While today's ruling will help reduce exposure to many, it will not help those on the West Plains who get their water from private wells. 
Earlier this month, the state of Washington stepped in to begin cleaning up PFAS near the Spokane Airport. They have issued an enforcement order that requires the airport to investigate the extent of the contamination and create clean up, clean up options. Rather, The department is also asking for public input on locations or history that should be included in the investigation. You can find a link to that story on creme.com. And that was your night beat. To learn more about any of these stories, just head to our website. That's creme.com.